It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, writing comics, drawing comics, designing characters, uh, managing your time as a cartoonist, uh, the lifestyle of a cartoonist, all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. With me today, we're going to talk about uh, cartoonists as performers. Something that we don't typically think of when we think of a career in cartooning, at least for me personally, when I was a kid, uh, I always thought of you know cartooning as like the best kind of uh, career and best kind of thing to be famous at because nobody knows what you look like. You can still be anonymous. You can still disappear, and you don't have to talk to people. Just go in your cave and draw all day, and you're done. But 21st century, things change a lot, and uh, it's more important than ever for us as cartoonists to do public performance events of some kind or another, and lots of us are doing it. And I'm so glad to have Mark Mariano on of MyPalMark.com to help us navigate this topic. So, hi, Mark. Hey, Jersey. Thanks for having me. All the way from... excited to be back here on uh, Comics Are Great. It's been a while. It's been a long yeah. time. Yeah, I think it was like 2011, maybe. Oh, my God. That's yeah. unforgivable. That is That's just... okay. <laughs> we still love you. We love you. I, I thought that was some of that New Jersey passive aggression. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had me on your show in a while. I'm not yeah. liking this. <laughs> What's wrong with you, Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> we'll let it slide. We'll let it slide. All right. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Everything you touch turns to gold, Mark Mariano. Uh <laughs> But Mark Mariano of MyPalMark.com, let's see, the author of, I've got some of the books here, Happy Lou, it's a fantastic book for young readers. Um, what, what, what's, give me the elevator pitch for Happy Lou. It's just okay. like obscenely cute, but there's sure. more to it than Well, that. the first one was a, a collection of eight short stories, and they're wordless comics, and each comic is followed by informational section, teaching arts and crafts and fun facts. Yeah, that's one of the neat things I love about this book, too, is that you follow up the stories with, okay, here's what we, I mean, as a fan of He-Man, right? Where right. it's like, here's what, we, here's what we watched. Here's what just happened today. Now let's reflect on it. Let's build on it. Let's take this to the next level, not just walk away going, that was a fun story. Like, you actually have thoughtful activities that are both art activities, but also sort of reinforcing the, the ideas that you're putting through in the story, right? Right, right. And it's all about, it's all about promoting creativity and imagination. And, and some of the best stuff is, is when I, receive, um, when I see, receive pictures of crafts that the kids did, and it's great to see, like, there's one where you can create a bug out of a water bottle. And it's just a whole recycling story, and and I that's one of those I always get a lot of pictures from that one because it's an easy craft. I try to keep them easy, you know, not needing to spend too much money or time even. So well, let's say that's simple. Good one. Let's say simple rather than easy, right? It's right, it, simple. Right, because you can put a lot of thought into a simple activity, but the activity itself has Very a simple true. entry point, right? Because, uh, yeah, that's another thing about the Happy Lou that I, I, I tell educators whenever I'm talking with them is like, get this darn book because it's deceptively simple. But what's happening when you engage with this stuff is actually really, really sophisticated. So uh, it's a fantastic book that every library should stock and every teacher should have for their classroom. The other one, this is for a little bit higher age, this is Flabbergast, which I would describe as Power Rangers with Zombies and Science. <laughs> Hey, that sounds great. <laughs> and it's it is as awesome as that sounds. Uh, it's not for as young an audience as Happy Lou, but it's still for young readers, right? It's still, I would say, very safe zombies, right? Yes. This isn't The oh, Walking absolutely. Dead. Yeah, I, I think with, with that is, um, I was a huge fan of Walking Dead, the the comic series, and um, so I said, you know what, I want to do a zombie story for kids, and nothing, you know. There's still a crazy threat, of course, but um, I didn't I didn't dumb it down. I just I made it a, just a really fun read for kids and, and parents to enjoy. And so it's a science adventure team, and they take on zombies and robots, travel to other dimensions where they're trained in kung fu. So I tried to pack a whole bunch of uh, the different locales and and everything you know, different characters into into one book. Yeah, there's like there's like a Mr. Miyagi frog and a rabbit, and then there's weird mummy aliens, and like it's like 
any literally anything can happen in this book right, and everything right. does and so like if you're a fifth grader oh my gosh why are you not reading this book so or yes. if you're a fifth grade teacher why do you not have this book in your in your school and then the newest one that we're going to talk about a little bit more later on today is the other side of hugless hill which is uh, a children's book it's mm -hmm. a children's comic book it's kind of like this weird it's like, sort of like um it's both a children's book and a comic at the same time because it uses like the language of both mediums, yeah, I would yes. say. Yeah. So, okay, I'll start by talking, uh, without going into like a pitch for the other side of Hugless Hill, how about I talk about the story because that's going to set up our discussion for today, this idea Fantastic. of the artist as the performer. Okay, so here, setting this up. Uh, cartoonists watching the show or people who are uh, aspiring cartoonists, I don't really like that term. If you're making comics, you're a cartoonist. But um, people who are making stuff you make stuff because you want people to interact with it. And you show it to the gals at the auto plant that you work at, or you show it to the other kids in your class, or you show the work to your family, and you get mixed reactions. Not everybody knows what to think of this thing that you made, right? They, they react in ways that not always meet your expectations, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Been there. And it can make you feel very isolated. It can make you feel like, you know, maybe I'm just a weirdo. Maybe I'm just the only one who really likes things the way I like things, right, after all. And, uh, and so here's this story, and I'm going to do story time now, uh, where, you know, Greenbow was a nice monster. He loved to draw. He wanted a friend to make art with him, and then he does this art show. But... <laughs> Bluck, Fum Fum, and Irma did not like art. They like to break, not create things. And so they're smashing up his art show. Poor Greenbow. Right? And then we cut to the other side of Hugless Hill. And there's this, uh, this gal monster named Mella. Mella loved flowers. She picked a bunch as a gift for the other monsters. But, you know, Popcorn, Tingling, and Toonie feared flowers. They fled as quickly as they could. So here we've got the artist dilemma. You love a thing. You're excited about a thing. You want to share it with people, and people don't necessarily react the way you know you had hoped. And so we get to the crucial existential crisis. You know, I'll never have a friend. Nobody likes me, right? People are reacting in the way that I had, I, not in the way I had hoped. So what do they do? They go. They set out. They go for a long walk, a sad walk, right? Oh, I'm just gonna mope around for a little bit, uh, as we artists do. And they walk away from their homes. And they pass each other on the street. And Greenbow says to Mella, you know, uh, or rather Mella says to Greenbow, that's a cool guitar and your kitties are cute. And Greenbow says, thanks, I like your flowers. He likes my flowers. She didn't eat the kitties, you know. And suddenly there's a connection made. Suddenly they realize, oh, I'm not the only one who feels really excited about things. Not, and so they wind up leaving Hugless Hill together. I'm totally spoiling the story, everybody. But... Uh, and they find that uh, there is a place for creative people to work. But how did that happen? They had to set out. They had to go forth and get, you know, uh, seek new horizons, as it were. And this is kind of where we stand right now. You just wrote the metaphor for the artistic journey in the 21st century, Mark. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't even know it. <laughs> but this is it, right? It's like you make the thing, and it's not enough just to sit around and make the thing, and then people go, oh, I don't get it. You know, what is that again? That looks weird. And you're like, oh, well, I guess I'm not good after all. Is that what you're going to do? Or are you going to go, well, there must be somebody who gets this. And so you set out to do it, right? Wow. So that's and, – and that requires us cartoonists to not be as misanthropic as we may want to be, <laughs> right? <laughs> Can't just stay at home. Uh, so – Okay, let's go through. I'm going to build this point by going through your career. We talked about the comics that you make. And you do kids' comics, which presents a special complication in trying to find an audience, right? Because you self-publish a lot of your work, right? Right, yes. So this is all available at mypalmark.com. And uh, Hugless Hill was through, did you do this through Amazon Create Space? Yes. The last, I think like last four books or so was, was done through them. So it's uh, available on Amazon as well. And... It's kind of difficult. There's a special uh, complication in trying to get the word out on the internet when you're doing kids stuff because kids aren't necessarily, they're not on Facebook or they shouldn't be, right. right? They're not on Twitter or they shouldn't be. Like when you're talking about eight-year-olds, right? Um, and they're not necessarily going to the web like, what webcomic should I read today? You know, I teach kids all the time and I notice that it's around 13 
13 is when they start going like, hey, there's web comics out there, and that's awesome. Like, I, got, I know a 13-year-old right now who just discovered Homestuck, and she's, right. like, diving in headlong, right? They but, love it. Oh, my gosh. Homestuck's yeah. huge. <laughs> yeah, with that age group, it's, it's gigantic. But, yeah. um, but you get earlier than that, you get, like, 9, 8, 7, not going to the Internet and to, to find their entertainment. So, you know, uh, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that complication personally? But, I think something I've learned over the years is that you do have to know your audience. And um, yes, while my main audience is kids, the bigger part of my audience is parents. And so you do have to sort of reach out to the parents, you know. So I'm reaching out to parents on Facebook. So parents that have, the, you know, the kids. And um, that's just, I, I think that's how I've been going about it now. When I first started MyPalMark.com, yes, it was the comic showcase of kids comics but then i realized exactly what you just said no no nine-year-old or, or you know six or even under are going to be looking for comics on the on the internet so right and and even if they are their parents not going to be allowed them going to some site they never heard of they want them to travel to like nickelodeon or, or something that they know a name brand mm -hmm. and so that's why i i you know, at the comic conventions, uh, we now have a huge sign that, that my awesome brother, Chris, wears on his back, and it says, Kids Comics. And it's and that's that's what I do. I mean, a lot of people, they, they see my stuff. It's very cartoony. And a lot of times they think it might be something like Hugless Tree Friends. I don't know how many times people say, oh, so this is like Hugless Tree Friends. Or they Happy Tree Friends. They each other, right? Yeah, Happy Tree Friends is what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, Happy yeah. Tree Friends. <laughs> Sorry. Let's not confuse the branding. Hugless Hill is not like Happy Tree Friends, everybody. Not at all. <laughs> None of my stuff is. It's, it's cute and it's fun and it's, it's, it's good for kids. So I do, now I know to aim it at parents and, you know, with, once they see the, the quality of my work, then they'll, they'll share it with the kids and, and then that's how I, I get fans in, in young kids and adults. Okay, before we go any further with this whole, like, getting to the parents, uh, I, I'm curious. Um, so, Greg Shegel of the Stuff Said Show, Stuff, Stuff Said Podcast, I should say, StuffSaidShow.com is his website. Right. He interviewed me a couple years ago, uh, and he asked I, I, a question that really kind of caught me off guard. And that's the great thing about his show. Everybody should listen to it because he asks really interesting questions. Um, and he said, like, you know, because I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I want to make comics for young people. And he asked... When did you know, and how did you know? Like, what, what, what inspired you to want to make comics for kids specifically? That is a very, very specific audience to want to hit. Um, so I'll, I'll steal his question, because, you know, if you're to steal, steal from the best. And I'll point sure. it at you. When did you know that you wanted to do comics for little kids? And, you know, what was, was there an instigating thing that made you say, like, oh, that's what I want to do? I'm guessing it, it was my art style. My, my art style has always been simple and, and very, you know, very a young look to it. And I've just always loved cartoons. I've never gotten away from cartoons. I love uh, Powerpuff Girls and Samurai Jack. And I'm Ninja a huge Turtles. fan of even the new Ninja Turtles. I'm, I'm loving that. And so I've always been drawing characters like that. And uh, one of my first comics I think I, I were actually tried pitching was, uh, I think it was just called, it was O-Man, and it was this uh, this blue blue guy, I don't know, but any, anyway, I tried pitching that as like a regular comic, and, and the story itself was still safe for a young audience, and one of the first comic conventions I went to, I think, was the New York Comic Con, and I saw at the time, it was uh, Jimmy Gownley, John Gallagher, and Rich Faber, they were doing kids' comics, and they had a whole section, which was just um, kids love comics. And I saw that, and I was like, wow, there's, there's actually guys that do kids' comics. And I think that, that was really the big inspiration for me, is, is seeing those guys and, and talking with them and seeing that, you know, there's, there is an audience out there. And I was like, well, maybe this is what I am doing. You know, instead of me trying to age it up or trying to aim it at the regular comic audience, why not try kids comics? And then like that night I went home and started drawing and it was a, it was a huge eye opener for me. And now I just think the world of comics and graphic novels for kids has definitely gotten much larger since then. Oh yeah. Yeah. And now I have the pleasure of working with those guys. So it's, it's fantastic. 
Yeah, are you are you working on uh, some published work with some of these guys? I, I, I thought I read someplace that you were. Um, or is it something you can't talk about right now? Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing really yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll wait on that. But yes, you're also, I mean, like you're a big kid. Like when we look behind you in your studio, I see He-Man sheets being used as drapes. Yes. <laughs> this window is Ninja Turtle sheets. So that's, that's when we were, we were painting my house and my father-in-law came over with a bunch of drop cloths yeah. and in a separate bag, he's like, Mark, these aren't drop cloths. These are for you. <laughs> <laughs> Ninja Turtle sheets and He-Man sheets. Uh, I put them to very good use. They've been uh, fantastic uh, curtains here in my office. I agree. Uh, okay. So well, what's also interesting what I heard in what you were saying and you're telling your story is that this isn't something where you came fully formed into it, where you were saying like, all right, I'm 18. I'm going to start making comics and it's going to be this. I know who my audience is. And, you know, you had to find your way through that just by looking at, well, my art style doesn't seem to fit in with this. Yes. Maybe it fits in with that. And like, Finding and responding to what other people are doing too can inform where you ultimately decide to land, right? Oh, definitely, definitely. So again, we come back to this like outreach and connecting with peers. We'll just talk about it a little bit more now. We got to talk about the fact that you're in a band. As I build my point here, because you are in a band called the Omatics. The Omatics, yes. Omatics.net. That's right. Oh, you have a book and record too. Rock and read. Yes. Um, love your guys' music. Hey, uh, thanks. I would, I would, I would call it kid-friendly rock and roll, but not specifically. You guys aren't Gemini, right? You're not like, oh, I want to be a pizza. Like it's something where parents and kids together can enjoy it in their own way, right? Matt, do we yeah, have absolutely. footage? It's very. Uh, they might be giants meets the Ramones. Um, I would say. I, I would guess. You know, recently they they uh, we did one show and they're like, oh, you guys are like the Wiggles. I was like, really? <laughs> We're like the Wiggles. I don't know about that. <laughs> At no time did I ever hear you guys go, you did it, you did it, you did it, yay. Yeah. <laughs> no, we we're not like totally. Like you said, we're, we're very family friendly. You know, right. there's obviously no swearing or anything in our right. songs. But on the other end, we're not, you know, very super kid-centric either. We just sing about fun stuff. Like we have a song about a llama that likes to go to the library. <laughs> <laughs> Other songs about Penguin Beach Party. You know, it's just, yeah, I don't really sit down thinking I'm going to write a kid's song. I guess it's the same thing for comics. I like fun music. I like fun comics. And I, and I just, I go about it the same way. I'm just there to write funny, silly, doesn't have to make any kind of sense music. That's who you are, right? That's right. I never make any sense. <laughs> No, I just mean like you're a guy who loves fun, silly stuff, right? Yeah. And I love the comparison of They Might Be Giants meets the Ramones. That that is a, a very, very apt uh, comparison because like They Might Be Giants, they put on a great show. I've seen them live a couple times, but I saw the Omatics live, and there is nothing that I can compare to in terms of the energy that you guys bring on the show. I mean, you guys like just it's like an explosion that hits you in the face when you watch Thank an Omatics show, you. an explosion of like happiness, right? <laughs> Um, so you're used to getting up in front of a crowd nowadays and putting on, you know, the Omatics personas because you guys all have, you know, your own Omatics name. Like your brother Chris is in the band, Chris Omatic. Chris Omatic. Jamie is in the band, Jamie Omatic. Right. And Mark Omatic. And, uh, not quite the same kind of persona as like, say like Guar or the Aquabats, but there's like, there's a persona you put on when you perform, right? Right. You don't, you don't go on stage and say like, oh, you know. Uh, Marco Maddox had kind of a rough night, so I'm gonna, you know, take it easy on this show. Everybody, hope you don't mind, right? You don't get to do that. You got to put on your your performance face. Um, so question: Were you always comfortable getting up in front of people, or is this something you had to adjust to and learn? Um, I guess I yeah, I guess I always was. When I was when I was younger, I we had our own TV show, we had our own public access show. And we ran that for about four years. I was the station manager for probably another four years. Oh, wow. And so I was just always, and then that was more of a villain kind of guy. <laughs> so that was very uh, cocky and laid back. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but yet in high school, I was super shy and didn't really want to talk to many people. So I, I don't know. I guess since then, like when I'm up in front of, and performing, then I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm okay. I, and, and once we'd started th with the Omatics, I would say maybe like the first, first uh, 12 shows or something, I, I was a little nervous about going up there. But then I just, I'm just, you know, 
ex express myself through music, just sharing that that music and just sharing it with with the audience. And so you weren't the class clown, though. No, no, I, I wouldn't think so. No. <laughs> so you were a shy kid in school, but for some reason, getting in front of a camera or getting in front of a crowd, there's like a separation that occurs. Is that what happens there? Yeah, I guess I guess it was like I was putting on a different persona. I think that's what it was, you know, like when I was on the public access show, it was a different persona. And then when I'm, when I'm on stage, I'm just more energetic and crazy. I remember when my in-laws first saw my, my first show, I was like, I had to give them a warning. I said, <laughs> I'm pretty crazy out there, I, you know, jumping around and doing all this. And, but, you know, they, they loved it. And, and that's just, you know, even still, when I have friends at work that might come out and see me at a show, they're like, oh, my gosh, Mark, that was crazy. Yeah, yeah, it, it's intense. You did a, you did a concert during K uh, Kids Read Comics last year, and it, it knocked my socks off. It was incredible. Um, you just, yeah, it's so much energy. But, okay, is how much of that – oh, God, this is one of those uh, – I'm, I'm even thinking about skipping over the question because this is going to turn into a Bryant Gumble thing. But – that that comes from you though, right? I mean, this isn't you totally putting. I mean, like when you're playing like the, the main station manager, that's acting. But when you're right. on stage, that's coming from some place that's like real for you, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's yeah, because it's. I think that's where um, my main personality comes out. You know, like of course my wife and my brothers and and they they know who I am and even like you and, and, and all my friends in the comics industry, people that I can actually be myself around, they, they know the, the, the person that I am. So all, all that definitely comes out when I'm on stage or when I'm talking about something that I'm super passionate about, like when I'm hosting my drawing game show or when I'm, when I'm teaching kids about comics and cartooning, yeah. I have no problem at all. But then if I have to follow a script, like one time I did a speech or something at a, <laughs> at a poster award ceremony, and it was it was for the um, it was it was a government affair. So they wanted my speech. They wanted to see what I was going to say in advance. But I'll tell you, when I was reading that thing, I felt so uncomfortable because <laughs> I was like, "Art is very important." You, you should, you know. And it was just yeah. I would have done way better if I just went up there and said, "Hey guys, when I was your age, I drew a book called The Elephant Farted." And, you know, the kids would have loved it. And then I would have said, and now I'm drawing more books. And, yeah. and I still keep drawing, you know, something off, off the top of my head, something that just, or from the heart is, is how I am way better, you know, reading in front of an audience I can't do. How do you know, how do you know when something's coming from the heart and when it's uh, in reaction to something else? Do you, do you have like a, a, a rubric for that? Or is this just something where you just feel it? What do you mean in reaction to something? Well... How do you know when this is coming from an honest place and this versus, well, people are just doing this now? Like what you saw, you know, John Gallagher doing Buzz Boy, and you're like, oh, they're doing kids' comics. That's awesome. I should do kids' comics. How do you know that you really wanted to do that versus, well, that's where the action is right now, so I just better be there, right? Uh, There's a difference. Very simple because I was that's what I was drawn to. Out of all the, out of, and especially like in an artist alley, the first time I've ever, ever went into an artist alley, I was blown away mm -hmm. because I saw there was, there was other kind of art besides just, you know, anything, the, the cookie cutter kind of art that you might see in Marvel or DC back in that time. Um, I, I was blown away to see the stylized kind of art and the more cartoony art. And that's what I've always been drawn to. I always, always loved that style. And so seeing that and, and reading that and that's really what what inspired me to to know that hey mark you can do this you can draw your simple characters okay so so it's like there's a, a general you know gravitation of preference that you you know that you like it regardless of whether or not you're doing it this is the stuff i like to read this is the stuff i like to listen to this is the stuff i like to hear people talk about therefore right. Maybe that's where I should be. Yeah, okay. and, and then, the, you know, the always thing is uh, you always write what you would want to read. You know, that's what I always say. Write and draw what you would want to read. And same thing with music. Create music that you want to hear. You know, because there's, there's an audience for everything. Right, but, you know, it's not, I mean, as somebody who works with young people all the time, not every kid is, is, is able to speak to what they gravitate toward, right? They, mm -hmm. they don't know, they, they, they're not even sure what they like much less how to talk about what they like. And that's like a whole other level of like teaching that I have to do where I have to like teach them how to look for the things that they like. But mm -hmm. 
you know, for a lot of us, it comes super easy. It's like, I like that. I don't like that. Right. right. And, but then for another, another group or for many of us, myself included, you can sometimes become bewildered by, well, that's what everybody seems to want right now. You know, if I want to do this thing, then I better give them what they want. Right. There's that scene in, um, uh, nightmare before Christmas. Right when Jack Skellington is talking about Christmas to all of the people of Halloween Town, and they just don't get it, and then he turns around, and he says, "Well, I might as well give them what they want," and that's when things start to go bad, right? Right, right. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a difficult line to walk, and I'm always curious how artists know when you know when it's it's something that's like honest and real, and when it's something where they're responding to the outside input. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, just a little bit more about performing as a band because. Okay. And doing speeches and doing workshops, too. Part of your job on stage is you're putting on this persona, you're putting on this energetic performance, but you're also reading the crowd, right? You have to know, like, oh, these guys, like, you know, the weather's bad, it's raining outside, everybody's kind of, like, coming in on, like, a low note, and I've got to, like, i got to pull out some tricks to bring them up to where I want them to be. Right. Or, uh, oh, these people are aggressive. Maybe i got to dial it back a little bit so it doesn't get out of control here. Uh, you know, I'm seeing somebody sitting in the audience like this, and I want to get through to that person. I want to make that person go like this, right? This is the majority of our shows. <laughs> <laughs> that's that... the majority of our shows start out with the low point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, that's a whole thing. Like, how do you read a crowd? Like, what are you doing? Like, what's going on in your head when you are performing and simultaneously reading a crowd? Well, um... <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we, we always love a challenge. And I, I think one of our earliest concerts, which is a great story, one of our earliest concerts was uh, somehow <laughs> the Omatics got put on like a death metal bill. What? <laughs> yeah, it was, like, it was like, this is early on in our career. It's like very, very heavy, <laughs> heavy metal. And so um, my brothers in music and I, we, we, we always dress all the same. We dress in bowling shirts. We dress in bowling. We have about maybe 12, 10 different uniforms we've used over the years. And of course, for this metal show, we wore our ice cream uniforms. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know it was a whole metal show. I guess we could have told, we could, probably would have known by the names of the bands if that's <laughs> all right now. But so we, <laughs> we go on stage dressed all in white. We were in white and red. Oh, we my God. Icons. And majority of the crowd are all these dudes with mohawks and, you know, <laughs> and they're, you know, they're, they're really, they're, they're really scary looking dudes and, and, and gals. And, and we just go ahead and we play. We, our challenge is like, let's win them over. We, yeah. we got to at least win one or two people <laughs> over. And a, a lot of the audience went like this, you know, they were just looking at us and then they're like, Hey, you know, it, takes, it takes some guts to get up there and do that. So, it, and that happens a lot. Like we always, we have what's called the omatic stare, which is just like a, you know, they just, they don't know what to make of the omatics at first when, when we're on stage. And usually by the end of it, my, my whole goal is to win, win the crowd over, to get some smiles from the crowd, to get some nodding, some foot tapping. You know, the, the younger audiences, they're going to dance. The older audiences, you're never really going to see the older on dan dance, but they'll do a head nod or something. Yeah, they'll, 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 yeah, they'll, they'll shuffle a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's always our goal. You know, no matter where we play, you're always going to have people that are into you. And even if they're not into you, they're, they'll still respect the music and the performance that you, you try. And so I think that's definitely all three of us, me, Chris, and Jamie, always, always are... are always up for the challenge to uh to make a crowd happy and uh, even if it's like three people or seven people we we put on a full full up performance every time I, I can i can verify this yes <laughs> <laughs> you know it, there wasn't six thousand people at your concert at krc but you guys acted like there were uh yep. it was it was amazing um but you know I, I love that you're putting a positive spin on this as like we accept the challenge, but uh, you know, getting in front of people is for a lot of cartoonists a very scary proposition. And uh, there's going to be times where, you know, especially like the first time I, and I've told the story a bunch of times on the show, first time I ever taught teenagers. And when you're a teenager, and I didn't know this, I, or rather I forgot this because I tend to focus on the younger age set and kind of empathize with their worldview more than what happens when you turn 16, 17. 
And uh, when you're 16, it's not cool to be very enthusiastic about anything, right? right? You know, yeah, you if can't show any emotion. You're not supposed to, no, because yeah. that reveals something about yourself, and that's dangerous right. because somebody could go lame and then, you know, per persona non grata, right? And so I'm teaching, and I'm doing my thing where I'm getting all excited about comics as I do, and all these kids are just with their arms crossed and looking down the floor and not looking at me. One kid falls asleep, and I walked out going, they hate me. They hate me. They, I was, I'm the worst teacher ever because these kids despise me. And it took a teaching friend to remind me, like, no, you don't know what they responded to. Uh, they're teenagers, and that's the way they operate. Like, it takes time to build their trust so that they do interact with you, right? Absolutely. But when you're doing a one-off thing, you don't have that luxury of being able to, you know, earn their trust. You've got, like, an hour, two hours to earn their trust. And so I, I think it's, it's important to underline this fact of, like, do you – well, I'll just ask you, because I'll, I'll say for myself, I don't always win that battle, right? Like, there are times where, like, somebody's like, uh-uh, and they say, uh-uh, all the way up to the end. And, I, and I, I take that as a challenge, you know? It's like, salesman face on. I'm coming at you, and I'm going to make you love comics like this. But that, that doesn't always work. Uh, does it always work with you guys? Do you always feel like you were victorious in winning over the crowd? As far as the omatics go? Yeah, as far as the omatics go. Uh, and also, I mean, we can move on to talking about teaching in just a second here. Um, huh, I'd have to go through. We've played a lot of shows. Yeah. I'm not going to say like every single show, people, everybody loved us, but um, yeah, I would say uh, majority of the crowd, yeah. yeah. yeah we, you know, there's definitely going to be some that, yeah, we're just not their cup of tea. We're just, you know, those guys are weird. You know, you, you're going to get that, you know? It's, you just got to. But you don't, you don't That's let all. that eat at you? What's that? You don't let that eat at you? Oh, no, never. No, I could, yeah, because there's always, for, you know, every, every time you're, you're watching news, it's always negative, right? And anytime people are are talking or, or seeing uh, reviews of your book or something, well, you know, even though you have like 1,600 uh, fantastic reviews, five-star reviews, there's always going to be that one or two that are like, this book is horrible. He has no talent. Right. And maybe at first that you know that that's going to bother anybody you know everyone always the negative always seems to outweigh the positive in that in that respect but i'm always a positive guy and i try to take it I'm like well i have like 1600 people liking this rather when you have like two people not liking it so mm. you're going to have that audience and you're going to have that time when even you have bad shows oh there's been plenty of times when the, the bass breaks down or i break three guitar strings in one night and and you just, I think even as a performer, if you let that bother you, then it's going to bring down the whole show, you know? And I think that's how all three of us, we work so well together with that. Me, Chris, and, and Jamie. Um, if Jamie will break a bass string, he's an amazing musician. He'll just play it on another string. He's, he's good like that. I don't know if I'd be able to do that, but he definitely can. And, um, and the other thing, too, is with, with music, nobody knows your songs. So. <laughs> If I miss a chord or if I maybe we accidentally uh, skipped over a bridge or something, we'll just keep going. We're not going to stop and, and say, oh, man, we messed up. No, we just keep going and, and the people are going to love it. If someone does notice, we go, oh, you did something different with that song, right? I go, yeah, you know, we always try a few things in the live shows. <laughs> All part of the show. Yeah, you got to turn everything into a positive. Yeah, uh, you know. Well, and another thing that I think, it, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but in, in when I'm doing public, you know, talks and classes and stuff, the audience who shows up, two things: one, they want you to do well because they're making time to be there to and to participate in your thing, and two is there's an implicit statement that you deserve to be up there. Right. And so like for me, it's like I got to act like I deserve to be up there. And if I go like, well, I'm not really good after all. And they're going to be like, well, then why are you there? Why are you standing up in front of us? Bring us somebody who actually is good. That's a very good point. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, I think that that's this is all important food for thought when, when thinking about the next thing we're going to talk about, because on top of all this stuff, geez, what don't you do, Mark? Uh, you do a ton of comics advocacy and workshops and events. So you are always traveling. You're always going to like every conceivable show where, where people will let you uh, hang up your, your sign. Um, and so you do, you do like workshops, like how to draw workshops occasionally, right? Right. Is that, is cartoon that characters. I, I do is, yeah, simple like uh, how to draw, you know, just cartooning characters and 
uh, creating characters and how to work if you have uh, if you're out of ideas and you know a good way of of being creative. That's that's my main thing. I'm always trying to impress everybody. And the other thing you do is you do these really cool comics game shows that the public can get involved in, and we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. But first, I want to hit the big the big question: um, Why? Why do all of this outreach stuff? I mean, I know you're in a band. You like to get in front of a crowd. You want, you know, you you apparently empathize with younger people, and you want people to feel more creative. But uh, what was the, was there a big idea in, or is this something that you sort of found yourself doing after a while? It's like, well, people asked me to do the thing, and I started doing the thing, and now I'm doing the thing. Or is it something where you're like, I need to reach out to this audience, and if so, why? Yeah, I think it, it's a bit of both. It's, um, I, I felt it was the next step to maybe reach out um, and just to, you know, a lot of my books, like I said, it promotes creativity, imagination, and what better ways to get kids drawing is than showing them, you know. And I work a lot with Alex Simmons uh, with the Kids Comic Con, and we did a, I think that's how you and I met, was that in Miami. Oh my Wait. gosh, yeah, that's right. That was a long yeah. time ago now. That was 2008. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. So that there was, I never did anything. I had no experience whatsoever <laughs> in, in teaching kids or teaching workshops. And Alex was like, Mark, we can fly out to Miami. I just need you to see some classes. And I was like, all right, whatever. Let's do it. <laughs> Alex Simmons is so amazing. And the kids, re, uh, the kids, um, uh, the Kids Comic Con is a super, super organization. It's a great event. And, yeah, he is really effective. There's something about his demeanor where when he says, hey, I need you over there. You're going to go teach some kids. Even if you're not ready, even if, like, you, you're like, oh, I was going to lunch or, oh, my arm hurts, you just do it. You, he's like Batman. He just, like, he tells you to do something. You just find yourself doing it suddenly. And you're like, well, how did this happen? Oh, it's like this, this weird presence that Alex has. I think because he's he's such a believer. He's such a believer in you, you know, as as an artist. And that's he was one of the hugest uh, proponents of me. I mean, he he I sh I shared with him, and it was weird. I just bumped into him at New York Comic Con. This is how we met. Bumped into him, and he saw I had a bunch of my floppies. I was handing out for Happy Lou, and uh, I shared it with him, and he loved it. And he's like, "We got to get together," you know. <laughs> it's just like right like that, and. And he's always been such a believer in my work, and I, I can't say enough good things about Alex. And, and so now I'm working with him on, on a lot of stuff that Kids Comic Con does as well. And so it, it was because of him and him believing in me, you know, I was able to teach kids. And, I, and at, that, at that event, I, I taught kids, and it went fantastic. You know, everyone, I, I saw the smiles, and I saw that the kids were sharing their work, which was something, oh, that was probably the number one thing that I, I was bad at when I was, when I was a young artist. I... I never shared my work. I was always nervous to share my work because you never think your work is great. You know, even now I'm still drawing things. I'm like, well, this could be better. Of course, you're going to always think that. Yeah. So just seeing that um, I was inspiring kids to share their work, it just got me to thinking, well, let me try some of these at, at the comic conventions. Mm -hmm. And I thought about doing panels and everything and about moderating panels on creating comics for kids. And I didn't know if I could fully do that. Um, uh, I did it maybe a few times at, at some of the smaller conventions, and it went great. It went well. But then I, I started thinking about doing, um, you know, more about uh, the drawing game show and, and getting getting comic artists up there that maybe normally don't do the same thing. Like like myself, I, this time I was trying to reach out to fellow comic artists that were a little nervous about getting in front of audiences. And I think that was one of the reasons I started doing Doodle Scribble Draw. Let's talk about that. So, okay, so you do the you start out at the Miami Book Fair doing visits or doing like workshops with kids, and then the next thing I know, you're doing these game shows. And one of the ones you let at Kids Read Comics last year, and you continue you've taken this this act on the road is Doodle Scribble Draw. We've got footage we'll pull up there. There it is uh, of of the actual activity. Could you describe what you do during the Doodle Scri Scribble Draw game show? Sure, sure. So it's just, uh, I've always been a fan of game shows. My father is a huge fan of Price is Right. He never misses an episode. The O'Matics appeared on the Price is Right, and Jamie O'Matic actually won uh, a, a good amount of money and, and prizes. So I always thought, hey, let's do a drawing game show. And uh, one, of course, that kids can go up there 
and draw with comic professionals. I mean, how awesome is that? I would right. love if I was a young kid going to a comic convention and I could draw next to a, a comic creator, that would blow my mind. Yeah. And then after you're done working on it, you get to keep the piece that you both worked on. Right. And, and so uh, what the, the game show is, is Doodle Scribble Draw, and there's, um, there's 12 different challenges, and the game's not going to go through all the challenges. Uh, each challenge lasts about 90 seconds, and the audience is a huge part in it. The audience is what I call the idea factory. And uh, um, so each, each challenge is a, is a drawing challenge for these two teams of uh, two comic artists. And they team with a young kid, a young artist from, from the crowd for every challenge. And the challenges are everything from drawing upside down to drawing the alphabet into the characters. And all the ideas are coming from the young artists and from the audience. So it's a, it's a great challenge for the audience, for the young artists, and, of course, for the comic professionals. That's and the winner wins a, a pair of championship belts. <laughs> Drawn by you, designed by you. But, yeah, yes. like, and uh, having an artifact at the end to commemorate your victory, I was, I, I was surprised by the, the, the psychological weight of that element because my team... Uh, I was on Team Zat Kid at because uh, I I participated in it at Kids Read Comics, and the other team had Rafael Rosado of Giants Beware, storyboard artist on Scooby Doo and Transformers, got m crazy giant bags of respect for this guy, and my I beat him in the game, you know, and I'm like that feels pretty good. But then I get this belt, which is in my studio, <laughs> you know, it's in my studio. I'm like that's the time I beat Rafael Rosado. <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge, huge thing. So. It's 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 a really cool like because I could see somebody saying like mm, game show drawing game show that's a bit trivial isn't it shouldn't you be teaching these children Mark uh, what would be your response to that like you absolutely are teaching them <laughs> see how so? it's not how so it's every you know it's every different challenges I could totally see the kids going home and like oh man I wonder if I can draw a car that's being swallowed by a shark in ninety seconds or something like that or can I draw this upside down. And it's all about challenging yourself to, to be a better artist. And it's, again, another thing is about sharing your work and drawing in front of people. It's, it's insane to see, you know, some kids, they might be, I don't know how many times I had parents come up to me afterwards. They go, I can't believe my son or daughter went up there and, and drew in front of all those people. Yep. And it's about, you know, like you're teaching them about, like I said, sharing and, and self-confidence. It's and just having fun. Just having fun with art, I think, is the number one thing to, to teach. No, Mark, you're supposed to be you at a lectern saying, <laughs> now shut up. Don't you dare interrupt me when I'm telling you how art works. And, oh, you give me the wrong answer. Sit in the corner, dummy, right? Right. Uh, the, that, that's like what I see in my head whenever a parent's like, your class doesn't really feel like a class. It feels more like a game where the kids are all having fun. I'm like, yes, but they're learning. And right. guess what? They're going to sign up for my class again because they have a really, really good time learning in my class, right? Um, but are you thinking about when you're designing the games? And now I'm just like trying to unbox this a little bit for the cartoonist who made it this far in the show and is like, hmm, maybe I should do more programs and outreach for, to help you know, broaden awareness of my work. Um, are you thinking about what the learning objectives are when you're designing the games? Or is it more like, that sounds like fun, and you wing it and sort of, or not wing it, but sort of intuit what the drawing activity is going to be? Uh, a little bit of each. You know, like before each contest or each challenge, I'll try and say, uh, I'll try and say, well, some comic artists use this technique when they're developing characters. And so for this, we're going to have a young artist draw a shape, and then uh, the comic professionals have to turn it into a masterpiece. You know, so I'll add a little something uh, about, you know, maybe the creative process into, into, into the game show, into the challenges. So I definitely think of both. And yes, number one, it's got to be fun. And I think about artists I'd love to see, you know, tackle these challenges. And each challenge I've done myself. So uh, I get to make sure that, hey, this can be done in 90 seconds. Right. And you're not asking anybody to do something that you wouldn't do yourself, right? Right. You said an interesting thing there, bringing in other cartoonists. How do doing, because like when you do a workshop, like when I do a workshop, it's me and the kids. And that's awesome. 
And there's these, like you said, there's wonderful experiences where suddenly kids feel more confident. They're showing you their work. And there's this other, you know, more enlightened self-interest aspect where suddenly they come to my table. Like at, at Kids Comic Con in Miami, every time I did a workshop, there'd be like 40 kids at my table waiting oh, yeah. for me, right? That was exactly. incredible. Um, so there's a personal benefit you get from that. But when you do a game show, as opposed to a workshop, suddenly you got to go, hey, Jersey, hey, Raphael, hey, Tom Eaton, right? Get over here. We're going to do a thing together, right? right? So how does doing those game shows, how has it changed the way you've done, for lack of a better term, networking, you know, connecting with peers? Oh, I think it definitely helped because now now there's there's definitely – Times will all show up at a convention. They're like, "Mark, are you doing doodle scribble draw? Can I get in on this?" You know, <laughs> when I when I first started doing it, it took me a while just to pitch the idea and tell people what it is. Yeah. But now that I have people that have done it in the past, I don't even have to explain it. They'll just tell their friends, "No, this is good. You're going to be on my team." You know, <laughs> <laughs> like I just did the awesome con was Easter weekend in Washington D.C. Yeah. and I had no one, no one set up for doodle scribble draw. I was like. I'll just wait until I get there and see who can come up. And it, it was there was a thread or something I did on, uh, I guess I just pitched it on the Facebook invite page. And all of a sudden I had all these different artists were responding to me and asking me to be on it. So it, it they pretty much booked itself. And, wow. and a lot of times what I tell the artists to do is is offer something to the audience too. Like what I always do is I say, if you come back to my table after the show, you tell me doodle scribble draw as a password, I'll draw you out a quick doodle. And, and it's a way you're getting people back to your table, you know? And Dawn Griffin, she just recently, um, she won uh, at Awesome Con, and she displays the belt on her table right across the front. And so, you know, she wrote her name in the, in the championship uh, portion there. And, and so people can see that and like, oh, right, that's right. We just saw her. And, and it's a way to get people back to your table. So it works in networking. You're meeting other cartoonists, and you're also meeting fans, too. So a lot of fans that, that you know... Um, I try to pass out um, flyers too for the event when I know what you know what time and what room it's taking place in. If I talk to a young artist at my table before the event and they're really big into it, I say, "Well, if I see you there and you're very energetic, I might bring you up there. You might be able to uh, to you know draw in front of everybody and draw with an awesome artist." So yeah. it's I think it's any any kind of uh, panel you do, I think is super super great for your your uh networking with fans and with um comic professionals well and what i love about this too is there's there's uh sort of a baked in tension when doing like because like somebody could say well i could just do a panel i could sit on a panel with people and that's a way to meet other cartoonists well first you got to get invited to the panel or right. or or propose a panel and get it accepted right and that's kind of hard um or can be but um, but then there's like this baked in tension of when you're on a panel, everybody's got to be clever and yep. you've got to be insightful. And it, it, and I mean, it's fun to do. I love being on panels, but it's it can be, you know, for somebody who's not, you know, not experienced in talking in front of a crowd. You've got the tension of I'm reading the crowd. I'm thinking about the crowd's question. I'm thinking about the, the moderator's question. I'm thinking about everybody else's responses. I don't want to step on somebody. Right. You know? uh, there's a lot of like tensions going on there. Whereas when you're in a game show. The activities are really boxed for you, right? The expectations are set into these 90-second intervals. And the pressure was off of me when I was on your on doing Doodle Scribble Draw because you're hosting it, right? right? You, you're, ta you're doing all like the, 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 the heavy lifting of managing the crowd and getting them riled up and introducing And all I got to do is just draw something funny and then respond to the audience's reactions to it. Exactly. So it's a, it seems like it's a much more safer way where I don't have to worry about being so clever. I get to be clever in the way where I'm most comfortable, which is on a piece of paper rather than being clever with my mouth, right? Right. And that, that's the other thing, too, is, uh, like I said, um, I wanted to have artists give them the chance to uh, not necessarily perform, but be in front of people. Because like, like we said, you know, it, it's, it's always tough. An artist just likes drawing majority of the time. It's not always, they're not always comfortable in front of people. And I thought this is a good way to get them up there. Uh, a lot of times I'll say, all right, so Jersey, explain, explain what happened in this drawing. And, and they really open up. They not, I've never had an artist that's just like, well, uh, I sort of just drew, you know, because they're talking about what they're passionate about. And they're, yeah. they're just having fun drawing with the, with the kids. And so they, they'll crack jokes and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll be more comfortable in front of our audience. And um, plenty of times I had the comic artist come up to me afterwards and say, Mark, thank you so much. I didn't think I'd be able to do that. I didn't yeah. think I'd be able to 
to take on a crowd like that or you know you, you help me and now I, I'm thinking maybe I can do some more panels or something like that so it truly is a situation where everybody involved wins I try yeah it's, I try, I try and, to do that I mean like again going back to the other side of Huglas Hill you're creating that moment with a game show right where Greenbow and Mella finally connect right it's like you, you meet other create you get to expose to other creators that is it in, in a social context like oh there's an after party right there's an after party great uh how do you strike up a conversation with somebody right i'm afraid you're gonna be really loud <laughs> well that's true yeah. especially if you go to something like spx the after parties <laughs> forget about it you, 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 there's no hearing anything but uh but like you know what do you do you, i like i like everything you do you know, right. okay, well, now we're going somewhere, I guess. Uh, it's, it's hard. And in this kind of context, now you, you've got some kind of shared experience where you can take it to the next level or however, right? Uh, okay, but we got to get to book recommendations in a second because we've got a librarian here who's going to come in and, and we're all going to talk about books that everybody should go out and read today. Uh, but I got one final follow up for you, Mark, and I'll give you the final word. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm a cartoonist listening to this thing, and uh, it's like, well, that all sounds great, but Mark's a rock star after all, and I'm socially awkward, and I don't know what – I don't know how to teach. I've never done it. I've never worked with kids. Why should I get in front of an audience? Why should I, I – I mean, I'm, I chose cartooning so I could stay in my cave. Why should I get in front of people? Because I'm socially awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I went up there and got in front of people and, and taught. I, it, the main thing is it, it's all about having fun. You know, it's all about, about sharing your passion. And, and I think most of us cartoonists, you know, we're very passionate about that. And, and I think it comes to anything. If you're passionate about basketball, you, you can talk about basketball. Oh, my gosh. I, I wish I had earplugs at work sometimes when, all, um, when there's a big football game. That's all they're constantly talking about. <laughs> they're passionate about it so right they can talk about that and i'm passionate about comics and cartoons and and drawing silly things and Damn. so i think that's why i can do that i think uh it, and what a great way you're getting recognition for it and you're getting paid for it you're getting paid to go to different libraries and schools to talk about something you love well i don't see one bad thing about it yeah uh, I, I i recently well and i've done this actually quite a few times but uh i was teaching a class that I'm getting paid for and I went into this whole rigmarole about shape usage in comics like shapes mean different things and I said let's take the Autobot symbol for a second and I said let's take the Decepticon symbol and let's look at the shapes that were used in those two things what signals are they sending to us what did the designers do and then I had like this involuntary reaction I was like take that Mrs. Cleveland <laughs> because I got in trouble for drawing transformers on my chemistry work when I was a kid <laughs> you know like I'm getting paid for this stuff now but but I mean but that's again that's what you did in this book is you got somebody who's crazy about something and often what happens is we find ourselves surrounded with people who go like all right chill out about Voltron <laughs> we're tired to hear about Voltron we don't care uh, and then it takes going out and reaching out to find the people who care about you find out that somebody loves Voltron possibly even more than you do right absolutely yeah and I think that's what the beauty of these comic conventions is just a lot of these people that get dressed up in these costumes are are always I'm sure they're always just shut-ins and, and soft you know a lot of times they're just they might be embarrassed in, in the regular world, but then when they go to a comic convention, you're there with all your peers, and you're like, "All right, yeah, I can be, <laughs> I can be dressed like Optimus Prime, you know, I can, I can do this." And yeah, and I think that's the beauty of it, you know. And for the most part, I would say ninety percent of the people in comics, especially people who make kids' comics, are pretty easygoing people who are really approachable, right? Oh yeah, there's stinkers totally. everywhere, but yeah. for the most part, most of us are in it because we love it, and then we we don't want to keep anybody out of it right yeah so. absolutely uh, that's it, it's a it's a crazy industry because you know even though you're set up next to your competition you're you're helping them because you're helping the whole industry you know yeah. like um i remember at miami book fair um another time i was there i was with i was with uh dave and reina and they both went off they had to go and do a uh, um um a workshop or something and they, while they're away I ended up selling a ton of their books because you know? uh, <laughs> audience would come up to me because I was sharing a tent with them audience came up to me and I showed them my books and I was like you know what I think you might like this book better and I and I showed them some of Raina's work because it wasn't they weren't my audience and and, and when I when they came back they were floored <laughs> yeah and, and, and you just think you know because it's just all about 
that's what I love about the industry. I love I love that about kids comics creators is that, you know, again, I'm always I always ask to be set up right next to them. Like I always do a lot of shows with John Gallagher, Steve Conley, and Dan Parrott, and because I know their stuff, and I know if they have to go away from the table, I could I could push their work, you know. Yeah. And while they might have some crossover with audiences. Yeah, every every single person's got a different taste, and their taste might not be for Happy Boy. It might be for Buzz Boy, and so that's that's the beauty of it. Yeah, yeah a lot of a lot of people, especially I'm going to say, especially in kids comics creators, but like I'll, I would say across the board, with a few exceptions of some stinkers, most of us realize it's not a zero sum game. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, we got to do book recommendations before we close out this episode. Oh my! Can you believe we just blasted through an hour mark? I didn't know we started recording. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to give. Um, we're to start with Rachel, Rachel Moyer, who just got here, and then if you got any book recommendations you'd like to make, Mark, we'll come back to you. Does that sound cool? Got them stacked right here, all set. Yep. Sweet. All right. So Rachel Moyer, uh, PLA at the Ann Arbor District Library, public library assistant. No. Associate. Close. Associate. A oh, public library associate. Yes. Yeah, you, you're not assisting the entire library. No. You're associated with the library. Yes, it sounds slightly more professional. Which is, which fancy, is, fancy, I guess. Librarian Padawan. Yes. For lack of a better term. My favorite metaphor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you got to recommend this time? All right, I have three things. Um, only two with me because one of them is actually a webcomic, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, right. The first thing is me totally giving into nostalgia. And this is not something that you actually have to pitch to kids at all because it is Pokemon. Pokemon Adventures. Literally, the just manga. tell a child, hey, it's Pokemon, and <laughs> they'll probably be down with it. But um, Pokemon Adventures is uh, a running manga that started probably really close after the first Pokemon came out. It's been going on a long time, and it, it follows the games more than anything else. Okay. And it's got uh, actually a pretty... Say what? You want, give me the book. I'll, I'll yeah, show yeah, the book while you talk about it. Uh, it's actually got a pretty good story going on through it. Uh, I know you think, okay, Pokemon tie-in comic, it's not going to be a very solid comic. It is actually a fairly solid comic, a good enjoyable read, and like I said, there's a nostalgia factor for me because it's one of the first comics that I was reading as it was coming out, so well, there's that. But I mean, um, it I is a very um, I guess the story is kind of intelligent. You wouldn't expect Maybe. I keep was, saying was that I got I'm was tripping on myself that, here. Because was the cartoon I do, that bad? Because I, the, the cartoon started off really well, and then it kind of went places. I mean, remember, but, you're, um, you're in a room with two guys who watch Mutant Ninja Turtles on purpose. Oh, I yeah. mean, <laughs> I did too, but no, I, I keep stepping on my own toes here. To say, but um, no, it, it uses a little bit more logic, I think, than you would see in the cartoon. Okay. Uh, the cartoon is very much, you know... Power of Friendship, which is awesome. Yay, Power of Friendship. I'm totally up for Power of Friendship. This, maybe there's a little bit more, um, uh, like the battles and stuff have a little bit of a more interesting factor too, because it's not like it's not you take a turn, I take a turn, you take a turn, I take a turn, kind of like how the game is. It's oh, like I captured it, your guy. Yeah, you got yeah. like in the beginning of it, you have the main character whose name is Red, uh, because Pokemon Red, um, going to Professor Oak's house and accidentally letting free all these Pokemon that Professor Oak has been training and studying. And oops, that's a problem. But um, he kind of bonds with the Bulbasaur as he's trying to help him ca recapture all the Pokemon. And then there's this other big scary Pokemon, which is a, ma uh, a champ, I think it was. I can still name them all. <laughs> wow. Uh, but anyway, the, the resolution of it is, okay, he's bonded with his Pokemon, so it's going to listen to him. But he doesn't know anything about the Pokemon or what it can do. But he uses his brain. He's like, oh, it's got a bulb on its back. Maybe if I give it some sunlight, it'll be able to use some sort of attack. So it's kind of, um, I don't know. It's hard to explain. <laughs> Why so I there, like there's, it so there, much. well, there's more drama surrounding the fights than just simple uh, arena battle. Yeah, I yeah. would say that, uh, and the the conflicts within are a little bit more uh, sophisticated. A little bit more sophisticated. A little bit more like there's a grand cons conspiracy going on with Team Rocket and stuff, and less like oh, Team Rocket's blasting up again. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I think it's actually if, in terms of Pokemon stuff, it, it would. Uh, hold up a little better as you get older. Okay. So. Uh, see what I find interesting about about your your uh, 
difficulty in, in describing it is, I mean, I went and saw the Pokemon movie in the theater when I was in my 20s because, mm -hmm. like, the, I thought, like, okay, I'll take my animation any way I can get it. The designs look great. You know, the premise is simple. You know, I'm on board. Uh, and I've, I've re read some of the comics, and the art is gorgeous. Oh, yeah, Just the art gorgeous. is really great. Um, but the, the thing that I get tripped up on is that I know the fandoms, like, fandoms always make things more complicated because there are some people who are like, no, I only follow game mm -hmm. continuity, I only follow cartoon continuity, I only follow comic continuity. They're all different, right? Right, right. Which, to me, says, well, that means there's my own jumping on point, right? So you're recommending that we try out... Pokemon Adventures, the comic. Right. If e you have a kid in your life that is super into Pokemon and you don't understand, maybe this is something you would want to read so that you can have, like, that point of reference with them. I don't know. I but don't know. I, I still think, I mean, even if you're just, like, a fan of kids' comics in general. I mean, Pikachu is an awesome hero. Yeah. And the, the Pikachu in this one is a little bit different, actually. Yeah. This Pikachu is kind of a troublemaker. <laughs> a little bit more of a uh, trickster character yes. than in the, mo the TV show. Yeah. But still, I mean, there's nothing, for me, like, it, there's, like, up there with Wreck-It Ralph and those kind of movies, mm -hmm. uh, the scene where Pikachu is trying to resuscitate Ash in the first Pokemon movie. So tough. So tough. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> cried. You, yeah. Well, I was, like, 22, and I was almost crying, so. <laughs> I'm sure if I watch it now, I would still cry. But, yeah, you it's know. pretty tough. And then there's that whole scene where Meowth is, like, talking with, like, uh, the other characters about like when Mewtwo is doing all this bad stuff. It's like, why do we got to do all this bad stuff all the time? And it's mm -hmm. like, wow, that's really profound for you, Meowth. But anyway, you got some other books to do, to talk about. I do, and I can probably talk about these a little more coherently. So right. that's why we did Pokemon first. Uh, <laughs> so the second book I have with me is Superman Kryptonite, which is Darwin Cook and Tim Sale, which mm -hmm. are two names that should make everyone excited. Um, it's not really an incontinuity book at all, going back to the idea of continuity. It's sort of just set vaguely in the idea, I think it's like two months after Superman has uh, come onto the scene here. Um, and the main conceit of the book is that Superman's never come across anything that like could really hurt him, and he's kind of struggling with the idea of, you know, can I be killed? Like, what's... Is there something out there? There's nothing that I've come across yet, but... So does he do uh, a Groundhog Day thing? <laughs> I don't know so much about that. But there's um, a really great scene um, where he's panicking because he doesn't... He, there's He's faced with this kind of situation where he doesn't know if he, this could kill him, and, and maybe it would. It would logically kind of could lead to his death, and... Uh, he panics and it doesn't end particularly well and the the guilt and the confusion ba around that leads to some interesting conversations with his parents um so it's a it's a very interesting character study and it's gorgeous it's got those chunky inks of tim sales just... yeah i can hold it up while you yeah. talk about it so, but um, um well so let me ask you this mom pa kent are they the good mom pa kent in this yes <laughs> They are not dead, which is a big point in their favor. Um, yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> this is way pre New, new 52. Um, and there's some really good interaction with Lois Lane. So, you know, it's 100% my book for that. Yeah. Um, so good. this is the first introduction of Kryptonite? Is that what it is? It is a version of the first introduction okay. of Kryptonite. Uh, it, it's not, like, meant to be the version, I think, in any specific continuity. I don't think even when it came out it was considered, you know, canon or what have you. But it is a, a good way of looking at it philosophically as opposed to just as, oh, no, suddenly I can get hurt. That's something I have to physically overcome. It's something that has to mentally overcome as well. And it's... Uh, I think a really good read for anyone that wants to read Superman without a lot of the, you know, baggage around it or who wants something that is a little bit uh a little bit more character based. I know there are a lot of great Superman stories that are character based, but this is one of those ones that I like to recommend. To well, yeah, so. I have that one on my shelf. So now I know I can definitely read it. <laughs> <laughs> I picked it up at a con a long time ago, so mm -hmm. cool, cool. Well, Darwin Cook is is a pretty good indicator that you're yeah. going to enjoy it if it's a superhero story. Few people get superheroes the way he does. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then you had a webcomic. I did, and the webcomic is called Cucumber Quest, and that's probably the one that's like most in line with everything we've been talking about, you guys have been talking about today, because it is an all-ages sort of kids webcomic, very kid-friendly. Um, but it's um, basically it's sto uh, following like a quest story of, oh no, we have to save the world, but the, it kind of really 
it plays with the the conceits of the genre quite a bit. The main mm-hmm. hero is very confused as to why he has got to be the hero. He was trying to go to school. He does not want to be a hero, and his his younger sister is way more suited in every way, shape, and form for it. But she can't be the hero because she's the younger sister for some reason, and it's a lot of fun. Um, it's uh, at cucumber dot uh, oh. g- 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 d- ddgg.com ggdd uh, I, 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 I'll get it right. I, I have to jump into the mix for this yes. one. It's cucumber.giggidigi.com. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> so that's kind of not the easiest one to remember, but it's it's a really fantastic story. A lot of humor. Um, all the characters are bunnies, which is fun. It's I, beautifully drawn. It's in this oh, painted style. It's got yeah. the most gorgeous color palettes. Just from our artistic point of view, I could just stare at the color palettes all the And I have day. to apologize for not having screenshots available. Well, pe- that, that's all the more reason people should go, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, you don't have to take our word for it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's just, it's that good. It, mm-hmm. the, the picture, we're evoking your mind of beautiful painted bunnies going on awesome quests and, and having some laughs. Oh, yeah. Yep. And awesome battles with giant squids and the nightmare night and all this sort of stuff. So it it's a really fun comic because it 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 both plays the kind of saving the world thing straight, but also adds a little bit of like, why are we even doing this? <laughs> Wait, are you saying there's been a hundred heroes before me? Like, why are we still going by this formula when we could maybe do it differently and save the trouble of having to do this every thousand years, sort of thing? And I don't know. It, it is, it is a, it's a really, really great comic, and everybody should go check it out today. It will be linked in the show notes if you don't remember that URL. So, Mark, do you have any book recommendations you want to share this time? Sure, sure. I guess I'd have to go with uh, definitely one of my favorites. It's uh, Astro Boy. You can't go wrong but, well, with anything by uh, Tezuka. Yeah. This is fantastic read, just about a young little Astro Boy, the little robot that always saves the world, and uh, big things about challenging um, uh, robots and fitting in with uh, an- another one that where robots are trying to fit in with the humans and some humans don't like them. So it's a very classic manga that I just we truly, talked, truly love. We talked about that one last episode. We talked about Pluto, did mm-hmm. we not? Yeah. Ah, yes. You've read Pluto, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I got a few of those. I didn't, I didn't finish the whole series, but yeah, that's, that's, been, that's been a fun ride too. But, but uh, Tetsuka, of course I have Astro the... Oh uh, yes, yeah. yes. Is, is oh my gosh, I love this book. Okay. One of the greatest comics made in the last hundred years. I it mean, it really is. It really is. I hardly ever laugh out loud when I'm reading comics, but so many times. <laughs> I know, I know. It's so good. So Ariel is what? It's a story about like a young donkey, just like in grade school, right? That's it. That's I- it. And the stories are super simple, and it's like sometimes it could just be a conversation. Like one of my favorites was when the two the two characters were talking about their fathers, and it was like, "Oh, my father's gonna beat up your father. My father's gonna sneak around and kick yours in the butt." And just just the way they talked, it just seemed as if I was listening to this conversation at a park. Yeah, and it was ah, oh, I, I love that. I just love the stories and and the characters. They really. It's just a really, really fun read. Um, I can't recommend it enough. It's and that's, that's, so good. It's so, probably like, my, my favorite book right now. The, 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 one of the most recent editions, I think it might be volume two, Ariel goes to the card collector shop. Do you remember yes. this one? And he's going there with his friend. And he's collecting some kind of cards, and it's like it's like some kind of like variation on Pokemon or something like right. that, if I remember right. And like he's missing this one, and the guy at the card shop doesn't have it. And this 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 bitter older grown man comes up. He's like, "You're never gonna find that card because they don't make it. Because they you know it's it, it's a big scam to get you just to buy more and more cards." And then uh, we find out through the course of his narrative that he once collected some cards, and he never found that special one that he always wanted, and that's why he's so bitter. And then the um. Air, the what was it? Ariel finds the card, I think. Yeah, I Ariel's, think the store owner ended up having it or something. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, I, got, st- I got like tons of those. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I got that card. It's right here. And the guy starts sobbing. He's like, I love you. I love the whole world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then Ariel finds the card that he's looking for, and that's it. That's the whole story. But right. the way it's told is so funny. Oh my gosh. 
That guy and, and I love the, the delivery. Like it's just a, so it's a book full of uh, 10 page stories and each story is a self-contained story and it's 10 pages. And I, and I think it just, it works well for, for kids starting to read and, and because, you know, you could just read this before bedtime and it's great. It's like, oh, that was a cool 10 pages. All right. Until next time. So, yeah. And I, I, I love telling short stories and I'll probably use that in a lot of, a lot of the uh, future books I'm doing too. Ariel. Everybody should go out and buy it today. Yeah. And then I had just uh, one more. This is uh, Bloop by Steve Connolly. And this book is absolutely beautiful. Uh, he, the regular size book is, I think, like 11 by 17. And it's a huge hardcover. Um, but I, I said, man, you got to do some of these up in six by nines, too. And so this is Steve is an amazing artist that does. Uh, he tells a whole comic story without using any panels. And just the, uh, the layouts and, and the story itself and the characters and the colors and everything on it is top notch. And I uh, highly recommend that. I think you can find more at uh, bloopthespacemonkey.com. Bloop the Space Monkey. Yeah, I mean, Steve Connolly, he's one of the very first web cartoonists, right? Yes. Astound mm -hmm. Astounding Space Thrills was right, his, right. his strip that Bloop first appeared in back in, like, what, 2001? Yeah, I think so. And he's an awesome guy. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, I, I'm so glad to find out that Bloop is still being uh, printed. Uh, so, and his stuff is just yeah, his stuff has always been gorgeous. Uh, so yeah, bloopthespacemonkey.com. We will link to it in the show notes. I've got two book recommendations. I want to talk about Star Bunny Inc. by my friend Dave Roman. Yes, he's my friend, but before he was my friend, I was a fan. And uh, he's launching a new web comic at starbunny.net, and the first chapter is in mini or digest comic form. And the only place you're going to be able to get it right now is at the Toronto Comics Arts Festival coming up beginning of May. So if, you, if you're going there, you need to stop by his table and pick up a copy of Space Bunny. With a, the premise is Blue Bunny is the eldest of his bunny family who have run a family business making milkshakes. But Blue is lactose intolerant. And so his brother, Green, says, like, is this the guy we want running our organization? And so he does this corporate coup to take over the family business. And Blue's sort of, like, forced out onto the streets to find his own way in life. And uh, there's all sorts of, like, in all these kinds of stories, there's all sorts of different guidances that one receives. And not all guidances are good. And uh, he, Blue is forced to make some really difficult decisions as to who his real friends are. And it's it's a... It's adorable. It's bunnies and it's milkshakes and it's a lactose intolerant bunny in a milkshake factor. That's pretty awesome. Uh, and then the other one I would say is that everybody should go out and get today is the, the other side of Hugless Hill because uh, as I pointed out at the top of this episode, this is the artistic uh, process, the, 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 cor the life course of the artist told for children. And if you have a young person in your life and you want them to be a creative type, this is the oh, the places you will go for the, the kindergartner <laughs> in your life, right? Oh, the first grader. Great quote. Why don't you use that one? <laughs> Embrace yourself, kid. It's going to be like this. But if you stay cheerful and if you keep doing the thing you like and you search and trust, you'll find that other person and or more, you know, who will like to make things like you do. And don't listen to all those other kids who like to eat cats and break things and run away from flowers. So... So yeah, The Other Side of Hugless Hill is a great book, Mark. Congratulations on the release of it. It's thank so... you so much, Jersey. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, gosh, thank you, Rachel Moyer, for the book recommendations and for all the work you're doing at comics.aedl.org. We've got events. We do have we have our uh, last comic artist forum for the before the summer, I believe. That yeah. is this Sunday, and that is going to be here at the downtown library from... Um, 1 to 3 p.m. 1 to 3 p.m. That's Brandon Dayton of uh, Green Monk's going to be talking to us. So uh, He's going to be talking about uh, dynamic line work. And this guy works for Disney Infinity, so he knows his stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Brandon Dayton, friend of the show. He's been on before, but uh, just an amazing cartoonist is going to be doing a presentation on drawing dynamically. And that's at the Ann Arbor District Library, 1 to 3 p.m., May 5th. Fifth, fourth. May fourth. May fourth. May the fourth be with you. Easy to remember. Ah, uh, that's right. And, and then, then May third is Free Comic Book Day. Yeah, lots coming up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, where are you going to be for Free Comic Book Day? Um, I'm not. Don't really have anything huge planned. So oh. uh, surprisingly, uh, <laughs> there's no kids-friendly comic stores around me, and that's that's a shame. Oh, no. That's a big shame. But I, I highly recommend everyone go to their local comic shop that's participating, and some libraries are always participating, so that's awesome. And uh, 
it's a fantastic event where you can go and sometimes they're having some great uh, artists on hand and you yep. pick up some free books and what's better than free. And LeVar Burton even, you know, did a Reading Rainbow recommendation for Free Comic Book Day. And I was like, that, that's the final word. If LeVar Burton uses Reading Rainbow language to say that comics are good to read, you don't get to argue anymore. Anybody who says, like, hey, comics, that's not real reading, show them that video and they're going to be like, oh, crap. You know? <laughs> <laughs> LeVar Burton said they're good to read. What can I say to that? You know, Bill O'Reilly would be like, oh, I guess I should shut up now. So uh, Free Comic Book Day is this coming Saturday. I'm going to be at Green Brain Comics all day, and I'm going to be doing free sketches for kids. So so if you have a young one in your life or if you are a young one who's watching this on YouTube, uh, come to Green Brain Comics in Dearborn and I will draw whatever you want for free. Uh, and I wind up drawing like Adventure Time characters, Pokemon, and then like suddenly they'll say like, give me John Cena. Uh, or I want, uh, uh, you know, oh, what's, a, what's a big baseball player right now? Um, like they'll ask me to draw one of the New York Yankees or something. I'll be like, oh, i got to look that guy up yeah, on my so phone. So basically it's a really good thing there's internet on phones. Now. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but sketches are free for kids all day at Green Brain Comics in Dearborn, Michigan. So um, I think without uh, the only other event to point people at is Kids Read Comics is coming up this June. Mark Mariano, you're going to be there. Yes, can't wait. We love that show. So it's going to be a huge blast. It's going to be great. Always is. You're going to be doing Doodle Scribble Draw there? And Doodle then... Scribble Draw. We're also going to be doing uh, our new music slash art experiment where DJ Chris Somatic will be spinning some different tunes and we invite artists and, and uh, fans and just people at the, at the uh, comic convention to just come up there and draw. And you just draw whatever you feel, whatever the music moves you to draw. So it, it's it's very cool to see what people come up and what music inspires them to draw. That is awesome. And and then also you're going to be performing uh, this the after the Sunday events at Kids Read Comics. You're going to be performing at Summerfest here in Absolutely. Ann Arbor. Absolutely. Well, we are going to rock it out. So you <laughs> <laughs> Grab onto something because the Elmatics are going to be performing at uh, Summerfest. So. Gosh, Mark, I'm so excited about seeing you this summer, and I'm so glad that we had a chance to catch up on the Comics Great Show. Thanks for making time to be here, man. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Jersey. And uh, it's, it's, thanks for doing the podcast. I love this show, and it's, it's, oh, it's great. It's great stuff. All right, well, once again, thank you to Rachel Moyer of the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.aedl.org. Thanks to Matt Dubay and Eric Kloster in the control room for putting the show together every two weeks. We will be back in a month. Uh, we're going to take the next episode off uh, due to scheduling difficulties, but uh, I might try to do something in between from home, but we won't be doing anything from the library. We'll be back at the end of May. And who knows what we'll do, but it will be awesome, so people should tune in. This show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG98. That's where you can find links to all the things that we talked about, all the links that Eric Kloster collected for us. And you can find the video and the audio. You can su subscribe to the show if you enjoyed it. A great thing you can do to say thanks to all of us for putting on this thing every couple weeks is go to iTunes, give it a star review, however many stars you think it deserves. If you're watching it on YouTube, give it a thumbs up, and that helps more people find the show. So thanks, everybody, for downloading, watching, and listening. And until next time, I've been Jersey Droz of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.